عبادي الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد respected Datu Rosli Sharif remember that name Datu Rosli Sharif who has organized these lectures and the Imam of Masjid of Surah al Amin here in Sitapak in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh this is the second uh, a lecture on our subject of money uh, the first lecture we dealt with what is money in Islam what is money in the Quran and what is money in the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam this is I believe important <laughs> for Muslims who say that they follow the Quran and who say that they follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam rather than central bank hmm? and we found from the Quran and we found from the Sunnah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam the answer for what is money we found the word dinar in the Quran although the central bank probably doesn't find it we found the word dirham in the Quran although the central bank probably cannot find it and when we found dinar and dirham in the Quran we found it as money as money and then when we turn to the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, we also found dinar and dirham as money. But in addition to that, we found that when dinar and dirham, which is a gold coin and a silver coin, were in short supply, that we were allowed to use other things as money and in the sunnah we found wheat and barley and dates and salt and in all instances money whether it was precious metals or whether it was commodities of food consumption which uh, had a shelf life not like mangoes and which were in abundant supply in the market we found that money in Islam always had intrinsic value the value of the money is in the money and it is a value created by Allah who alone can create wealth this is fairly simple but the governors of central banks cannot understand it it is fairly simple yes I have to speak this way because I have been teaching this subject for 20 years and they will not listen to me the governments will not listen to me the central banks would not listen to me with their PhDs in international monetary economics they will not listen to me but tonight I have a message for them that they'll have to answer in the grave I have a message for them tonight that they'll have to answer in the grave and there'll be no one to help them for the monstrous betrayal for their monstrous betrayal of the Quran for their monstrous betrayal 
of Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam for their monstrous betrayal of the truth which has come from Allah. In consequence of that monstrous betrayal, there is injustice in the world today all around. There is oppression in the world today all around. There is increasing poverty and destitution in the world today all around. And every drop of tears which fall, they'll have to answer in the grave. Not only will the governments have to answer, not only will the governors of the central banks have to answer, but you'll have to, excuse me, I have to mention as well, the scholars of Islam will have to answer as well. And so tonight we have to give a warning to our learned and distinguished brothers, the scholars of Islam, the muftis, their excellencies, the muftis, the maulanas, the shuyukh, the alamas, <laughs> that if you have not been teaching the subject, if you have not been warning the people that there is money in the Quran and there is money in the Sunnah, and money is always money with intrinsic value, that the value of the money is always created by Allah, it is not fictitious. I don't know the Malay word for fictitious. Someone help me? Fictitious. Huh? Paltu. 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 It is not fictitious. If you have not been teaching this subject, and hence warning the people concerning what is happening in the world of money, then you, the scholars of Islam, you will also have to answer in the grave and we are warning you. We are warning you. That was the lecture on what is money in Islam. And now tonight, it is now already 10 minutes past 8, we have only 35 minutes before the Azan. We look at what is money in the modern world. Uh, the lecture is too important, so we'll have to stop for Salatul Isha. And I hope you will not abandon me and turn your backs on me and go back home. So we'll continue after the Salatul Isha. Promise me? Good. Before we look at what is money in the modern world, let me take you to Surah Al-Nahl of the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he sent down the Qur'an to explain all things. If the Qur'an has come down to explain all things, would it not explain the strangest event to have occurred in the religious history of mankind? That Allah destroyed the holy state of Israel? That Allah destroyed the masjid? That Allah expelled the Jews? that Allah placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own until a certain time in history. And 2,000 years later, the Jews have returned to the Holy Land. They have reclaimed it as their own. And now they are the only people on the face of the earth. While the Ummah of Muhammad is eating biryani and going to sleep. And the Orthodox Christian world seems to be eating whatever it is, pasta and going to sleep. Only the Jews 
are waging an effort to restore a Khilafa state? Only the Jews? No one else? All the rest of the world are comfortable with the modern state. But the Jews want to restore the Khilafa state. We don't have the time to explain to you what is the Khilafa state. But that is what they want to do. They want to restore the original Khilafa state which was established by the Prophet David, Dawood alayhi salam, and the Prophet Suleiman, Solomon alayhi salam, which they called Holy Israel, but the proper term is the Khilafa state. And the definition of a Khilafa state is that Allah's law is the supreme law, and that is what they want to do. When they complete their mission in Jerusalem, there will be no United Nations ruling over Israel. No, they will not allow any United Nations organization to rule over Israel. So we can continue to eat biryani and go to sleep. The Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Surely the Quran will explain this amazing phenomenon. Of course, they're doing it the wrong way. And as a consequence, they will fail. But leave that now. Surely the Quran will explain how come the Jews have returned to the Holy Land after 2,000 years and a state of Israel has been restored? Why, why, why can't you, if the ulama are falling, fall asleep, your learned and distinguished and exotic muftis have fallen asleep and they will not explain to you from the Quran if they are incapable of doing it then why can't you do it? You take over from the muftis and the maulanas and the shuyukh if they have fallen asleep and you go to the Quran and let the Quran explain. The first thing we learn is that something called modern western civilization appeared on the stage of the world. And it is modern Western civilization which appeared on the stage of the world with an agenda. If you did not know it, let us tell it to you. An agenda of establishing the political and economic and financial and monetary and every kind of dominion over the whole world, over the whole world, including the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. The only way they can succeed in establishing their political dominion over the whole world is if we surrender the Khilafah state. Allah's Messenger gave us the Khilafah state that the Jews got from Nabi Dawood and Nabi Sulaiman. We got it from Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. We surrendered the Khilafah state. Not only have we surrendered the Khilafah state, we don't even remember it. We are comfortable with the substitute which has come, thanks to Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. We are comfortable. Because Dr. Muhammad Iqbal said that this is a valid substitute for the Khilafah state. That is what your Alama said, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. And they call him Alama. I will not speak 
disrespectfully of him. Now, he was a great scholar and an even greater poet. But if today we have surrendered the Khilafah state, no one has done more to achieve that surrender than Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. Not only have we surrendered the Khilafah state, in consequence of now, of which we now can have look forward to world government, one government to rule the whole world, including the, the Ummah of Muhammad Islam, because the Khilafah state is gone. Nobody even crying over it. We've surrendered the market. They can now have one global market, controlling the market. And if you didn't know it, it's a market of thieves. It's a market of thieves. The free and the fair market is gone. Islam gave to the world the free and the fair market. A Muslim has no advantage over a Hindu in the market. A Muslim has no advantage over a Jew in our market. No. We do not engage in economic boycotts. We do not engage in that shameful thing called economic sanctions. We do not use trade and business as a weapon, not in Islam. We say that business must be contracted or conducted illa an takuna tijaratana an taradim minkum. The beautiful language of the Quran. That in the conduct of business, there is mutual satisfaction. So if Russia trades with Turkey, there is, there is benefit for Russia and there is benefit for Turkey. And if you impose a trade boycott, you cut off your own nose. That's our conception of business. So we never use trade. And we never use business as a weapon, not in Islam. That market is gone today. We surrendered the market. In consequence of which today, they dictate the terms of the market. And we are slaves in the market. I had to give you this, this, this introduction to, to take you to the point now where I can say to you, we also surrendered money. We also surrendered money. The money which is in the Quran, the money which is in the Sunnah, we surrendered it. And what did we accept in return? Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the language in the Quran, I can use it. He says in Surah Al-Jum'ah that the example of a people who were given the Torah and then did not live in accordance with the obligations which came from the Torah is that of a donkey, otherwise known as an ass. And Imran calls it a jackass. It's the same word, a donkey, an ass, a jackass. But the word jackass has more sting in it. So I use that to sting them. Allah says, it's the example of a jackass with a load of books on his back. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا الطَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَصْفَارَ Yes, we surrendered money like a bunch of jackasses. And up to now you cannot find a prominent scholar of Islam anywhere in the world who is prepared, who has the courage to stand up and say that the substitute which has come 
is bogus. It's fraudulent. It's haram. What is that substitute? Before we introduce the substitute to you, let us explain to you one more time that modern Western civilization came on the stage of the world with a mission to establish its political and economic and monetary dominion over all of mankind. To rule the world. If you did not know that, I am telling it to you. Someone said it long before me, if you don't believe me. The eminent British historian, Arnold Toynbee, wrote a book entitled Civilization on Trial. It was published in the 1940s. And in that book, this eminent British historian said, this is what Western civilization wants to do. It's there in that book. <laughs> but the scholars of Islam don't study anymore. No, they don't. And I have to restrain myself because my anger is so great. One of the ways in which there is, they establish their rule over the world is to take over, take away the Khilafah state from us so they can establish their political dominion over us with the United Nations and so on. Another way in which they establish their rule over us is to take away money, which is halal, and replace it with another kind of money through which they can establish their control over the world. Their control today is so powerful. Their control over the world of money today is so powerful. They're even the most powerful states in the world are afraid that if you step out of line they will destroy your money they have a weapon it's the most dangerous weapon ever created in human history more powerful than nuclear weapons it's called inflation and if you step out of line they destroy your money. Hugo Chavez, with greater courage and integrity than all of your leaders in the world of Islam, their excellencies, their majesties. Hugo Chavez, my neighbor, because I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, he's next door in Venezuela. Hugo Chavez, a Christian, not a Muslim, Hugo Chavez, with matchless courage and integrity, stepped out of line and challenged them. Today, the Venezuelan Bolivar is destroyed. <laughs> Today, Venezuela has the highest rate of inflation in the world. And they do that to Venezuela to tell the rest of the world, you do what they did, this is what we'll do to you. And so the rest of the world have learned their lesson. Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. What did he do? <laughs> 20 years after Zimbabwe had become a so-called independent state. Independent, eh? But a bunch of British farmers owned 80% of the land, the arable land of, of Zimbabwe. And the black masses of Zimbabwe were poor while these British farmers are wealthy. So they were now launching a revolution after the revolution against Mugabe for the constitutional agreement that he made. 
stupid. And when Mugabe saw what the, the fire of the people, how angry they were, he took the land away from the British and gave it to the people. And because of that, one telephone call I wanted to make in Harare Airport, because my flight arrived too early, and I wanted to call my people to tell them I've arrived, so I needed to change some money to make one telephone call, local call. How much will it cost? They said $2 million. $2 million. <laughs> So from the time you step out of line, they destroy your money. And so now we are slaves. That's where we are. We have to obey them. Because if we do not obey them, our money will be destroyed. And we'll be as poor as the Indonesian made. Hmm? What? How did they do it? How did they get us to surrender money? After they got us to surrender the Khilafah state thanks to Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. The answer is, they made haram, but Allah made halal. In Surah to Tawbah of the Quran, if you did not know it, listen because you'll be questioned in the grave. In Surah to Tawbah of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Itakhazu ahbarahum waruhbanahum arbabam min dunillah wal masihabna maryam. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا يَعْبُدُوا إِلَاهًا وَاحِدٌ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ سُبْحَانَهُ عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ They took their priests and their rabbis as lords and God beside Allah and they did the same thing with the Messiah, the son of Mary. But they had not been ordered other than to worship one God. There is no God beside him. Far removed is he from this shirk of taking your Mufti and your Mawlana as your God beside Allah. So a man came to the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, and said, O Messenger of Allah, but the Christians do not worship their priests, and the Jews do not worship their rabbis. How could Allah say so? Which surah is this? Somebody tell me. Surah to Tawbah, very good. The Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, replied and said, Did they not make halal what Allah made haram? That is shirk. Would you kindly tell your government, please? Call them on the phone and tell them for me, please. Because every minister of government will have to answer in the grave. Every sultan is going to have to answer in the grave, so they should know. Did they not make haram but Allah made halal? That is shirk. If you make haram but Allah made halal, that is shirk. And did the people not follow them in it? That is their shirk. Example. Allah had prohibited riba, borrowing and lending money on interest, riba. But if you go to the Torah today, you'll see the Torah says that it is haram for an Israelite to lend money on interest to his brother Israelite. A Jew should not lend to a Jew on interest, no, haram. But it is halal. He can lend money on interest to those who are not Jews. No. That's wrong. You made halal what Allah made haram. And the rabbis accepted it and the people followed the rabbis. I lived in New York for 10 years, I know. So what they did was to make haram what Allah made haram, halal. 
in order for them to institute a monetary system which will prohibit the use of gold and silver as money they needed big walls and they needed a window wall and that is the first and second world war and a new monetary system came to the world after the second world war that monetary system has been with us since then 1944 but I have news for you tonight there's another war coming and it's just around the corner and when that war comes they're going to finish this monetary system they don't need it anymore and they'll bring a new one but the Mufti doesn't know that who gives his bogus fatwa that the money we're now using is halal Mufti are you listening to me Mufti you're going to have to answer in the grave Mufti for declaring this money to be halal no this money was possible because they first declared that money to be haram the articles of agreement of the international monetary fund prohibit the use of gold as money dr mahati was not aware of that i am not a politician i don't comment on politics but when someone does what is right i declare that he was he did what is right and i don't care who who is annoyed with me a scholar of islam doesn't bow his head before public opinion dr mahate was not aware that the international monetary fund prohibited the use of gold as money but Dr. Mahate was able to recognize, as no one else recognized, that this was wrong. That this was wrong. That you cannot prohibit the use of gold as money. And Dr. Mahate did what no one else did in the history of this country. Let me remind the Malaysian people if they need to be reminded. The Dr. Mahathir did what no one else did ever be, ever did, and perhaps no one else will ever do. When I met him, I told him that. I said, you are the only second one to do it. The first was General Charles de Gaulle. General Charles de Gaulle recognized that this was wrong, this was unjust bringing a new monetary system in the world and in order for this bogus system to survive you have to prohibit the use of gold as money so charles de gaulle stood up in the french national assembly in 1966 that's why the french people love charles de gaulle and he blasted them in the French National Assembly, he blasted them. And he declared this to be an unjust monetary system that you brought into the world. And so they took out their knives for him. Yeah. And they finished him. And after Dr. Ma after Charles de Gaulle, the only other one, the only other one was Dr. Mahathir. And so this country should be proud of Dr. Mahathir. Because he recognized what no one else recognized. And no one else dares to recognize. They don't have the courage to recognize what he recognized. And tonight I have to give credit where credit is due, regardless of the price I have to pay. At the time when I said that Dr. Mahathir was only the second, I was wrong. I didn't know he was the third. I didn't know that there was one before him. I didn't know that there was one before Charles de Gaulle. But he's today forgotten. 
They call him a playboy. <laughs> Ahmad Sokano was more than a playboy. Ahmad Sokano was more than a playboy. When Indonesia became independent, Ahmad Sokano called in the Olana. He had the courage to do it. And he asked them about this money. I'm not a scholar of Islam, you are the scholar. Tell me, how can we have paper as money? How can we have paper as money? And the ulama replied to him and said to him, the paper would be halal only if it is redeemable in gold. Meaning you could take the paper and get the gold at a fixed rate. So the paper will be like a check. So Ahmad Sokano decided that the Indonesian rupiah would be redeemable in gold. And he fixed the rate. But the people who want to rule the world, they had made that haram. In the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund. So they had to launch a coup via a crooked man called Suharto to get rid of Sukarno. So there were three. And then long later came Najmuddin el Bakken in Turkey. And if this, lead, if this lecture were to reach you in Turkey, I want you to remember Najmuddin el Bakken because that was the last leader you had. That was the last leader you had in Turkey because he put the gold dinar up in front of the people and he said this is money. Nobody dares to do that today. Nobody dares to do that today. In 1944, we have another five minutes before the Azan. Let me take you to the conference that took place when the Second World War was coming to an end. Allahumma Jalla Jalala. So we continue, inshallah, after Salat. Bismillahi awwaluhu wa akhiru. What is the story? How did they do it? How did modern Western civilization get us to surrender the Khilafah state? How did they get us to surrender the free and the fair market and introduce the banking system to destroy the free and the fair market? How did they get us to surrender money? <laughs> that is a story which ought to be told. The most important actor at work in every single one of these battlegrounds was Britain. Britain led the way in getting us to surrender the Khilafah state. Britain led the way with the Bank of England, which was established somewhere around 1796, I believe. I can be wrong to get us to surrender the market, the free and the fair market. And Britain got us to surrender money as well. And so if you pledge your loyalty to Britain, you couldn't be serving Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. And that's what Muhammad Iqbal did. If the people of Pakistan and the people of India are not aware of it, I ask you to do your homework. Up to the day he died, Iqbal was a loyal subject of Britain, pledging his loyalty 
to the British Crown and the British government, yeah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, was a loyal, loyal British, pledging his loyalty to the British Crown, to Britain. The All India Muslim League were all people who pledged their loyalty to Britain. Amongst the ulama, there were those who refused to do that and they went to prison. <laughs> but the people of India and Pakistan chose to abandon the scholars of Islam and to follow those who neither knew the Islam, the Quran, or but were unaware that Allah had prohibited in the Quran their pledging their loyalty to Britain. They didn't, they didn't even know it. And so he became Sir Muhammad Iqbal. I'm not disrespecting him tonight because he was a great scholar and he's a great poet. But somebody has to set the record straight. If I do this in Pakistan, they'll arrest me. So it has to be done from outside of Pakistan. Somebody has to set the record straight. Britain played the most strategic role of all in every single one of these battlegrounds. And yet the founders of Pakistan pledged their loyalty to Britain. And yet I must believe that you are serving the mission of Islam. What a joke. What a joke. What Britain did was what the banking system is now doing. The bank has so much money that's all. But the bank lends 10 times more. It's called fractional reserve banking. It is unjust. It is a system of legalized theft. And you should have your hand cut off for that. But they established the Bank of England to become the big thief of all. And so the sterling pound is riding high. Britain can lend. Britain can become the money lender of the world. Because Britain has so much gold, but Britain is lending so much paper. And all that you have to do is get off what is known as the gold standard, and then you can print the paper. So that's how it started with paper which is no longer redeemable in gold and the bank in issuing more paper than you have gold. <laughs> the sterling pound used to be a gold coin and then one Sunday morning perhaps while they were in church it became paper. <laughs> And so you have a monetary system now emerging in the world in which the British pound is the supreme currency, the international currency. And Britain becomes the money lender of the world. And Britain is becoming richer and richer. Whoever owns a bank is very rich. Why? Because you can make money out of thin air. And they call it fractional reserve banking. But the real story that we have to tell, and somebody should teach this story to the scholars of Islam, the ulama, because they don't know it. The real story doesn't begin with the Bank of England. The real story begins after the Second World War was coming to an end when they came together in an international conference in a place called Bretton Woods in upstate New York. And the leader of the British delegation was a very famous economist called John Maynard Keynes. And Britain went to the conference as, you know, his imperial majesty, hoping that they'll be able to salvage something for the sterling pound. But the time had come for Pax Britannica to go. 
and the time had come for Pax Americana to replace Pax Britannica because in the Quran in Surah Al-Mursalat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said something but it didn't we didn't catch it now he said in Taliku ila zillin the salat shu'ab proceed now let the historical process now proceed to a shadow which will now descend upon the world a shadow and this shadow will emerge in three stages in three stages when imran gives his opinion in interpreting the quran or interpreting the hadith i beg of you never 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 to accept my opinion i can't do more than that can i please tell that to my critics for me please <laughs> never accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that i am correct that's the way i was with my teacher and that's the way i want you to be with me so if i make a mistake and you continue to perpetuate that mistake what kind of student you are but if you correct your teacher ah masha allah may allah bless such a student so if i correct dr muhammad iqbal i'm not doing anything disrespectful please understand that i say that the three shadows represent the world order of britain pax britannica in which the sterling pound now controls the world of money and then pax americana which re replaced pax britannica and then the us dollar replaces the sterling pound and now we are reach we have arrived at that moment in the historical process when i as a student of international relations that's what i am i recognize that the united states is now in irreversible decline you don't have to believe me check check it out there's a great war coming because that's what they use they use big wars to bring about fundamental change and that a new actor will come to replace pax americana i recognize it as pax judaica because their objective is to establish what we call the khilafa state that's what they want to do but they're going about it the wrong way and therefore that a new monetary system will replace the existing monetary system so goodbye to the us dollar and when the us dollar goes the euro will also go yeah and the entire system is based on the dollar your ringgit does not have any legs on which to stand i'm sorry to tell you that i'm sorry to tell you that your ringgit has no legs on which to stand no and when the us dollar goes your ringgit is also going to go and every single paper money in the world will collapse with it you don't have to believe me you could follow mufti So these are the three stages of the shadow which is by opinion and do not accept my opinion unless you are convinced that I am correct but you can't say I'm wrong unless you tell me what's right <laughs> is that asking that is that asking too much of my critics i'm getting more and more critics all the time Yeah some of them probably are paid to become my critics so i ask you you cannot say i am wrong 
until you say what is right. So come forward and tell us what is right and hope that nobody laughs at you. Hmm? This is what they brought into the world at Bretton Woods in 1944. A monetary system through which they effected the passage from the sterling pound as the international currency to the US dollar to replace it. That is Bretton Woods. From Bretton Woods came the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And these two, Bretton Woods and the IMF, brought into being a monetary system which we have to explain to you briefly. Forty years ago when I was in the classroom listening to this for the first time I am a student of philosophy. I did my master's degree in philosophy and I'm a student of Islam at an institute of Islamic studies. And now I'm in the classroom of international relations and I'm listening to international monetary economics for the first time in my life. And I'm hearing these strange things. That paper will now replace gold. However, in this world of paper, one paper is chosen to be redeemable in gold. But why not the Pakistani rupee? Why does it have to be the US dollar? Dr. Mahathir asked himself the same question. Yes. There's something wrong here, something fishy going on here. That the US dollar is going to be, it will be an advantageous thing to be the US dollar. Hmm? Something is fishy going on here. That's what Dr. Mahathir thought. That's why he studied the subject and then he blasted the system as bogus and unjust. That's what he did, Dr. Mahathir, before he resigned, retired. Only the US dollar would be redeemable in gold, meaning you could convert US dollars to gold. That's the meaning of the word, redeemable. But what about all the rest of the paper? Where is the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? The Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam now is a slave to the US dollar. Really? Is that what we did? You will not know the value of any paper currency in the world of Islam except in its relationship to His Majesty the US dollar. Is that where the Ummah of Muhammad has gone today? What is the value of the Pakistani rupee? Or oh, so many rupees to the dollar. What is the value of the ringgit? So many ringgits to the dollar. Something fishy going on here. So all of these paper money which have no redeemability in gold are all bogus and fraudulent and haram. All, all, all. And the ulama in Indonesia in the 1940, late 40s when Indonesia became uh, independent, they recognized it. Or was it 50s then? The ulama in Indonesia recognized it. So what about the rest of the world? Oh, the US dollar, however, has a fig leaf to hide its shame. Because at Bretton Woods, they decided the US dollar would be redeemable in gold. And they fixed the price at $35 for one ounce of gold. Before this, the US dollar was redeemable at $20 an ounce of gold. $20 an ounce of gold. And then the US government, with the aid of the Federal Reserve Bank, which had just been established, did a ripoff of the American people. I have to tell you the story. They, they announced 
that it is now illegal to use gold as money in the United States. It is illegal to keep gold in your home. You can keep jewelry, but not gold as money. The law requires that every American resident must sell your gold to the government at the rate of 20 US dollars for one ounce of gold. And you can trust the US dollar because it print there, in God we trust. If you are caught with gold coins after a certain date, you will be charged 10,000 US dollars and face six months in jail. That's called wickedness. <laughs> so the American people had to sell all their gold to the government at the rate of $20 an ounce of gold. Like a nation of jackasses. Or those who are not jackasses, they put their money in boxes and ship them out of the United States to Switzerland. <laughs> yes. Then after the United States had bought all the gold in the United States, the government, they did the unthinkable. They changed the price of gold. <laughs> they say now the US dollar is no longer twenty dollars to one ounce of gold, it is now thirty-five. And you better buy back your gold before we change it again. This is nineteen thirty three. And the American people had to rush to buy back their gold at thirty five dollars an ounce, and in the process Uncle Sam ended up with 40-something percent of all the gold in the United States, free of charge. You know, if you buy a gun, before you actually use the gun in battle, you'll want to test it. To go on a shooting range and you trial run. What happened in 1933 was trial run by the Federal Reserve to see if the system will work. That by changing the value of the paper, bring it down lower from what it was, is sometimes called devaluation. Devaluation. But in the process, of course, Mufti doesn't know the subject. And the government, the governor of the central bank doesn't know the subject. Call them on the phone, please, and tell them. When the value of the paper fell from 20 to 35, there was a massive transfer of wealth from the American people to the government. 40-something percent of the gold was transferred. This was done at a national scale to test the system before it starts operating internationally. Before it starts operating around the world. So now can you hear? If you have ears, you can hear. It's like a vacuum that you use to clean the carpet a vacuum, a suction pump. Can you hear the suction pump? As the value of the paper money falls, like a suction pump, the wealth of the Algerian people is being suctioned off. We have some Algerians here tonight, one from Britain, one from Germany, uh, how many other Algerians we don't know. Uh, the Algerian dinar is now at about 105, 106 dinars to one US dollar. The Bangladeshi taka is somewhere around the same. The Pakistani rupee is somewhere around the same value. 
the Indonesian rupiah is about 10,000 to 1 US dollar. Hmm? And as a consequence, during this period of time, while the ulama of Islam, let me restrain myself and restrain my language so that I don't be impolite. While the learned, in, the learned and distinguished scholars of Islam had time to teach every other subject underneath the sun. That's what they do. From 1944 until today, the suction pump has been at work, sucking the wealth of our people, making our people poorer and poorer while they become richer and richer. And so you used to have something called the proud Ottoman army. Turkey was a, uh, the Ottoman Empire was a great Islamic empire. And we were proud of the Ottoman army. Well, guess what? The people who used to serve in the Ottoman army, killing the innocent Christians, eh? killing the innocent Orthodox Christians, that's what they're paid to do. These people who used to be such fierce warriors in the Ottoman army, guess what I saw them doing? Because of this monetary system. I saw all of them selling gasoline in petrol stations in Long Island. Yeah. Anywhere that I stop to buy gasoline for my car in Long Island, it is Turkish young men selling gas. And yesterday you were in the Ottoman army. Hmm. Singapore is a, the model state, the model state. Tell me how many Singaporean women, if you are uh, annoyed with me for mentioning the name Singapore, how many Indone Singaporean women will work for the wage that you pay to the Indonesian maid? If you are honest, if you have one grain of honesty in you, is there any Singaporean woman who will work for that wage? that the Indonesian slave is working for. Huh? She's my daughter, you know. Yeah, she's my daughter, she's my sister. And you tell me this rubbish. Oh, but she can, when she takes the Singaporean dollar to Indonesia, it's worth so much. Is that all the sense you have? Is that what Islam taught you? This is the market here in, in Singapore. In this market, in this market, can you find one Singaporean woman who will work for the wage of a slave? None. None. But I have news for you. Thank Allah that there is the grave. Thank Allah that there is a grave. Because every single Singap Indonesian maid you had and you paid her the wage of a slave, you're going to pay for it in the grave, yes? Make toba, make toba. It doesn't matter whether you are Chinese or Malay or whether you are Christian or Buddhist or Hindu. The religion of Abraham Ibrahim alayhi salam has zero tolerance for oppression. None, no tolerance at all for oppression. And if you oppress anyone, anyone, you're going to pay for it in the grave. So they started off the monetary system by giving to the United States dollar an unfair advantage. It is the king currency. It is the only money which is redeemable in gold at $35 an ounce of gold. And all the rest of the paper money in the world is linked to the US dollar. You have no legs on which to stand. None. But that's not all the story. You and I can't go to the United States and 
offer our $35 and ask for an ounce of gold? No. Only a central bank can do that. Nobody else can do it. And since we just won the war, we have power. No central bank will be so stupid. <laughs> no central bank will be so stupid to ever come with US dollars to ask for gold. They're all scared. Hmm? So the system is designed to allow the United States dominance in the world of money until Charles de Gaulle came along. And he did what no one dared to do before him. He said, I want the gold. <laughs> when he stood up in 1966 in the French National Assembly and denounced the monetary system as unjust and oppressive, he then ordered the French National Bank to send the US dollars to Washington and demand the gold. And for that, they hated him. Because if everybody else does this, the system will collapse. Why? Because the United States is doing what Britain had done before. You're printing more paper than you had gold. So you're becoming richer and richer and richer, but doing it fraudulently. So Charles de Gaulle had to go. Hmm? The system is no longer even 1% halal. It was 1% halal when one currency was redeemable in gold. 99% is haram. But at least 1% is halal. But this 1% which is halal is even less than 1%. Because the paper is being used in the market. So it should be redeemable in gold in the market. But it is not redeemable in gold in the market. It is redeemable in gold only to central banks. And central banks would be too scared to do that. <laughs> so it is point zero zero one percent halal. And the rest of it is haram. But this is of course too difficult for Mufti to understand. Too difficult for Mufti to understand. Waste of time trying to teach Mufti. The system is almost totally haram. And yet we do not have the world of Islamic scholarship recognizing it to be haram. We surrendered money without even a fight. That's what we did. But these people were very cunning. They knew that this monetary system would remain vulnerable if it were to be challenged with gold. If anyone were to have enough gold to make their paper money redeemable in gold, which is what Ahmad Sukarno wanted to do, then that one currency would bring down the rest of the monetary system. Just one currency which is redeemable in gold because you have enough gold and you only issue that much paper for the gold that you have. That one currency will bring down the whole system. So in order for this monetary system to succeed, you got to get the gold of the world. How to get it? And it must be in your pocket. You can't trust them. It has to be in your pocket. How to get the gold of the world? What they did and it was very strange to me as a student sitting in the classroom at the age of 29, I'm now 74, that they, they created something called special drawing rights, a new kind of money, SDR. 
And they said, every country in the world must now declare how much gold you have. Meaning gold reserve, not, not jewelry, gold. How much gold you have. And it is prohibited for you to sell gold without informing the IMF. If we ever catch you selling gold or buying gold without informing the IMF, the consequences will be terrible for you. And remember, we're ruling the world. So every government now told the line and they inform exactly how much gold they have. So now they know how much gold there is in the world. <laughs> and the IMF articles of agreement prohibits you from using the gold as money. Number two, you have to take 25% of your gold and send it to Washington. Put it on a ship and send it to Washington. 25% of your gold. And the jackasses of the world put 25% of their gold on the board of a ship and sent it to Washington. And the IMF said, trust us, we're going to keep it safe. Keep it safe for you, yeah. So now they have, by simply, simply making a rule, they have 25% of the goal of the world in the pocket. If you dare to ask back for your goal, see what we'll do with you. Uh -huh. Okay. So what about the other 75% now? What are you going to do with your goal? It's just lying in a vault eh? in Jakarta, in Kuala Lumpur, in, in uh, um, New Delhi. And it's getting rust, dust on it. It's no value to you because you cannot use it as money. You can't use it to buy and sell. So we are suggesting to you now that uh, we can offer you soft loans. You know, at one and two percent interest. Yeah? And uh, you can use your gold as security. So instead of going to the commercial banks to borrow money at 8% and 6% and so on, we, the IMF, that Allah sent down from the heaven above for everybody, we, the IMF, will give you at 1%. So all the jackasses now started borrowing money from the IMF, leverage against the gold. And now the IMF is demanding, well, we got to keep the gold. You get to keep the money, we get to keep the gold. So the transfer of gold is taking place. Because everybody wants US dollars. What can I use with the gold? To make filling for the teeth? Huh? <laughs> Can't do anything with the gold. Might as well have it as US dollars. Okay? If we get the US dollars, your son could go to university in Boston. And your daughter could go to university in Chicago. And you know, you could buy a house in Miami and a house in, uh, in Los Angeles and let the Pakistani people go to hell. It doesn't matter to them. <laughs> so there's a transfer of gold taking place through this method. Until none of them have gold anymore, except a little handful. And all the gold has gone up to Washington. But Uncle Sam has more up his sleeves. There are those who refuse to borrow money from the IMF for the gold. Because they recognize the gold has value, like Germany. So Uncle Sam says, you must give the gold to us in safekeeping. We'll keep it for you. 
And because you're dependent on the United States, this is Big Brother, you can't get him annoyed. So they all send their gold to Washington, Fort Knox. Safekeeping. Germany had, I think, 3,000 tons of gold. And the German people decided recently, we want our gold back. Uncle Sam said, no. That's it, full stop. So the German government said, we want to send auditors who will go and check to see that the gold is there. Report to us the gold is there. Uncle Sam said, no. Full stop. So what are you going to do? Send the German army? <laughs> no. In this way, they were able to accumulate all the gold of the world. But Allah says about Akhir Zaman, sorry, Hadith of the Prophet that in Akhir Zaman, the earth will vomit from its liver columns of gold and silver, meaning more gold will come into the market. Even if you cornered all the gold in Washington, there's still more gold coming out. And Russia is mining the most gold in the world. Zimbabwe is mining gold. South Africa is mining gold. And uh, what are you going to do with all this gold coming into the market? The answer, you got to manipulate the price of gold. So the price of gold will not be determined by market forces of demand and supply. But in London, in the one particular corner of London, they will fix the price of gold. A man came to the Prophet والسلام, and said, O Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Fix the price. Establish price control. The Prophet said, no. Normally, we know once the Prophet said, no, that's it. The man came back a second time and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, prices are too high, fix the price, establish price control. Price of Tetarik is this much. Price of Roti Chennai, this much, put it up on the board there. Fix price control. The Prophet said, no. The man came for a third time. And for a third time, the Prophet said, no. That in Islam, there is no price control. That in Islam, prices are determined by the market through demand and supply. When prices are determined by demand and supply, then prices will go up and down, up and down. But now we have two forces at work. Number one, we have a tax on paper money. So as the paper money goes down in value, the prices go up. It's called inflation. When I went to study in Pakistan in 1964, one US dollar was convertible to 1.75 Pakistani rupees. One US dollar was equal to one and three quarter Pakistani rupee. Today, one US dollar is about 105 Pakistani rupees. <coughs> As the value of the paper goes down, the prices go up. Prices go up. I used to go to the grocery shop to buy grocery for the month when I was living in Pakistan. And with 700 Pakistani rupees, 
it was enough for me to manage my home and my family for one whole month. 700 Pakistani rupee. Today, if I were to stop at the gas station to fill my tank of gas, 700 rupees will not give me enough gas to drive two, three miles. That's all. <laughs> As the value of the paper goes down, the prices go up. But you have another force at work now. It's not just inflation. It is there manipulating the market and fixing the price. So at artificial low prices, they can buy all the agricultural produce low, at next to nothing, dirt cheap. And the one thing that is of utmost importance, gold, which can cause their system to collapse, they fix the price of gold. And they decide when the price of gold is to change and when the price of silver is to change. As a consequence of which, a few, two, three years ago, mashallah, everybody were buying silver dirhams and gold dinars because they realized this is where you have to get some security. And then suddenly, something happens in the market price and the whole thing collapses. <laughs> and now when you want to sell back your dirham or sell back your gold, you're getting a loss because they are manipulating the market price of gold and silver. Which reminds me that I have to warn you and those who are listening to this lecture that I am anticipating, I hope I'm wrong, that the war is going to start soon. In fact, it's going to start exactly where Nabi Muhammad said it will start, in the north of Syria, perhaps Aleppo. Hmm? And once the war starts, I don't know how soon it will become a nuclear war. At that time, I'm saying to you, I'm anticipating the collapse of all the money in the world. Because once the US dollar collapses, all the rest of the money will collapse. Uh, can someone hand me the balloon, please? We brought a balloon today because it's a nice way to understand the subject. What they're doing is expanding money as much as possible. Fake money, imaginary money. You take a piece of paper, you print a picture, you put a number, and you give to it a fictitious value. And the jackass will accept it as money. Hmm? That's what we are, jackasses accepting it as money. They have done it in such a way that the whole world is now engulfed in this paper money. And if you try to get out of it, there is no way you can get out. None. So since Allah says in Surah Al-Taghabun, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah to the extent that you have capacity to do so. It means that we have to try to get out of the system to the extent that we have capacity to do so. Hmm? One of the ways in which you can try to get out is through barter. I have a student of mine here with me tonight. He left KL, he sold his house, he gave up his job, he bought land an hour and a half out of KL, cheap land. He built his house, he has a farm. Mashallah, I went there, it's absolutely beautiful. He has goats, he has ducks, he has chicken, he's planting date palms, he's planting food crops, he has a, he has a pond for fish farming, and uh, he has three horses. And he's done that right here, about an hour and a half out of KL. So when I went to him, I took some of my books, he wanted some of my books. I said, okay, let's do barter. Bata, you have a goat, and I had the books. 
I want you to barter to me your goat at the market price. Whatever the market price of the goat. But my books, I'm going to sell you at a discount. He said, no, that's not fair. <laughs> I said, no, you're buying these books because you want the knowledge to reach the people. So I'm going to give you a discount, but you don't give me any discount. So we did barter. In the last lecture we had, that Rosli had five kilograms of rice. And he was selling his five kilograms of rice for one dirham. You can do that. The police never came and arrested him. He's still here with us. Check him out. Yeah. He was selling his five kilograms of rice for one dirham. Hmm? Uh, so you can, you can have buying and selling based on dinar and dirham. And you can also have barter for bypassing the system. The system is like a balloon. And they have designed it like this because one day they want the balloon to, be, to become too big. They want it to become too big. As the balloon becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you know the time is drawing closer and closer. When it's going to burst. You know the central banks, they know it. The central banks they know that the balloon is about to burst, but they wouldn't tell you that. They know it, but they wouldn't tell you that. Because they are not fools, they are not stupid. They know what's happening in the world of money in the central banks. The, the, the rate of expansion of money because it's not paper anymore. It's called quantitative. What is it? Q? QED. 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 Quantitative easing. And they just expand the amount of money by so many trillion dollars. Yeah. And as this rate of expansion accelerates, the balloon is becoming bigger and bigger. And every banker knows that this balloon is going to explode. They all know it. And they know that when this balloon explodes, if you have gold and silver, you get away. But if you don't have gold and silver, and you don't have any money with intrinsic value, you finish. I may be wrong, but perhaps if you have some money in the bank, the bank might be able to salvage something of it for you, maybe 5% or 10% and the rest will be gone. But if you had your money out of the bank, when the balloon bursts, you could use it as wallpaper. Is the balloon about to burst? And what's going to happen when the balloon bursts? I have to leave Bretton Woods. I have to leave the International Monetary Fund. And I have to take you now to 1971. And I have to take you to the hadith, the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad wasalam, which is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And those of you who have been listening to me are all already familiar with the hadith and my interpretation. So I can be rapid now. The river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold and people will fight for that gold. 
and 99 out of every 100 who fight for the goal will be killed. And each one will say, I'll be the one who will survive, but the Muslims must not touch that goal. Number one, no war in human history, no war has killed 99% of combatants. So this has to be a unique war in human history. Secondly, it has to be a war using weapons of mass destruction. Normal weapons cannot kill 99%. No. With weapons of mass destruction, the one that we are, we are um, accustomed to now is nuclear weapons, and thermonuclear weapons. What else there is, I don't know. So this appears to be the malhama that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. And in Christian eschatology, it's called Armageddon. I'm being rapid now. <coughs> what about a mountain of gold? Can a mountain of the metal come out from underneath a river? Is this muhkam, something to be understood literally? Or is it mutashabih, something to be interpreted? The Salafi methodology is that only Allah and his messenger and the early Muslims are authorized to offer an interpretation. So the Salafi, and I'm not being disrespectful to them, so they should not be annoyed with me. I don't have any boxing gloves on. The Salafi methodology will be, you got to sit down and wait for the mountain of the metal from come out, to come out from underneath the river because there is no interpretation given. But we say no. If you want to sit down and wait, you can wait. We have understood this to be mutashabiha. And we say we have the right to interpret. When we interpret, however, we must always say Allah knows best because we can be right, we can be wrong. We say that something underneath the river in a vast quantity symbolized by a mountain is one day destined to function as gold and it's oil. That one day oil will function as gold. And that the monetary system which will be based on oil functioning as gold is one day going to be challenged. And that challenge is going to lead to the Malhama or the Great War, Armageddon, in which 99 out of every 100 will be killed. Has the prophecy been fulfilled? Is oil functioning as gold? Because of my training in Islamic studies and also my training in international relations, and I thank Allah for that, the normal scholar of Islam doesn't get this chance. I was able to recognize and to interpret this hadith several years ago. I said that in 1971, when Charles de Gaulle had already died, but the French government continued his policy, and France demanded from the United States certain amount of dollars to be redeemed in gold, I don't know, three billion or so. Richard Nixon realized that this is now too dangerous. And he decided to scrap Bretton Woods and scrap the IMF. The United States had an obligation, a legal obligation on the international law to redeem the dollars for gold. The United States says, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. That's what they did. And yet everybody wanted a U.S. visa. So they took the agreement and they tore it up. And so from September 1971, even the 0.001% that was the system that was halal was finished. The U.S. dollar is no longer redeemable in gold. 
As soon as that announcement was made, the US dollar started to lose value. It was $35 an ounce until September 71. And then it started to drop until it reached 40. Between September 1971 and the Arab-Israeli War of 1973, the US dollar was in no man's land. If it was attacked, the whole system could collapse because it's not backed by anything. So in 1973, the Zionists were able to pull it off. The biggest victory they've achieved since Adam alayhi Islam set foot on earth was in 1973. When the war between the Arabs and Israel took place, and the Zionists were on both sides of the war. They were on the side of Israel and they were on the side of Anwar Sadat as well. The Soviet Union was supposed to be a great friend of the Arab, but the Soviet Union was created by the Zionists. Yeah. And the Soviet Union was serving the Zionist cause. Although there's reason to believe that perhaps Stalin was uh, a little bit different, but that is uh, another story. When the war took place, they knew that there would be an Arab boycott. Faisal had, uh, Faisal had warned that he was going to institute an Arab oil, oil boycott. They wanted the oil boycott to take place. When uh, Saudi Arabia instituted the oil boycott, the US dollar collapsed by 400%. That never happened in history before. From $40 an ounce of gold, it fell to 160 by 400%. And the price of oil rose from $3 a barrel to 12 by 400%. Suddenly the Arabs are rich. They're reaping money 400% richer. It was then that Henry Kissinger flew to Riyadh and made a deal with Faisal. And this is the deal. That if you will sell your oil for only US dollars, we tell you what you're getting now is peanuts to what you're going to get in the future. Whatever else there was in the agreement secret, I don't know. But Faisal fell for it because Faisal didn't have any scholarship. And the Arabs began to sell their oil for only US dollars. And then OPEC was born and OPEC instituted that oil can be sold for only USD. Even if you have gold dinars, you still can't buy oil only with USD. When that agreement was struck, an ocean of oil began to function as a mountain of gold and the petrodollar was born. This is my interpretation of the Hadith. I've given this interpretation now for several years. I can't get one scholar to come forward and stand with me. So mine is still <laughs> a lonely voice crying in the wilderness. But as I said, you should not interpret, ex accept my interpretation unless you're convinced it's correct. What has happened over the last few years is that more and more people are convinced that I am correct. And my critics are biting their fingernails in frustration. Because what I'm saying explains the world. And their scholars can't do it. If Imran Hussein is wrong, well then tell us what is right. So we got a petrodollar monetary system now, which has replaced the Bretton Woods monetary system. Is the mountain of gold being threatened? Are they about to fight for the gold? Yes, yes. Russia 
emerged from 60 or 70 years of communist rule that the Zionists had imposed upon Russia to destroy the Christian foundations of Russian society. If you can't understand that in Bosnia, go home and do your homework before you criticize Imran. If you can't understand that in Albania and Macedonia, go and do your homework before you criticize Imran. Russia was attacked. That's what they did to destroy the Christian foundations of Russian society with communism and the Soviet Union. And then what was written came to pass. And Russia emerged from communism and the Soviet Union to recover its Christian heart and soul. And as Russia has recovered its Christianity, not Western Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, as Russia has recovered its Christian heart and soul, Russia is challenging them. Russia is a nuclear power. Pakistan is a nuclear power. Malaysia can't challenge them. <laughs> Indonesia can't challenge them. Algeria cannot challenge them. But Russia can. And Russia took the lead. And China, you can say what you want about China, but China stood up with Russia. And then India joined them and South Africa and Brazil and BRICS was born of five countries and these five countries under Russian leadership they're now challenging the petrodollar monetary system that's what's happening and if this challenge continues the petrodollar monetary system will collapse, the balloon is going to explode. So that's why the war with Russia is inevitable. Because it is in the Hadith, it is in Sahih Bukhari, it will take place. When the war does take place, 99 out of every 100 will be killed. But the Muslims must not touch that goal. What is the world going to be like after the Malhama? How should we respond when our scholars have betrayed us? I have to restrain myself from my anger. The scholars of Islam have betrayed us. If I'm wrong, tell me, who are they in the United States of America? Who are they in the United States who are standing up to say that the US dollar is haram? Is there anyone in Britain who is standing up to say that the British pound is haram? That the monetary system is haram? Is there anyone? One, one, one? How do we respond when our scholars have betrayed us? Let me end with the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad I know only one scholar who was courageous enough to quote this hadith. And may Allah have mercy on his soul, he was Pakistani, Dr. Israr Ahmad, Rahimahullah. Nobody else quotes this hadith. Sahih hadith. You shikwa yati alanas is a man. It will not be long before that time will come. La yabaka min al Islam illa lasm. Illa lasm. When nothing will remain of Islam but the name. Yes. We have surrendered the Khilafah state. And you still say we have everything in Islam. We have surrendered the market. And you still say we have Islam. We have surrendered the world of money. And you still say we have Islam. Go ahead, eat your biryani and go to sleep. 
Nothing will remain of Islam but the name. And nothing will remain of the Quran but the traces of the writing. Because you will not go to the Quran. So the Quran will tell you that there is a Judeo-Christian alliance controlling the United States and Britain and France. And that Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance is Gog and Magog. At that time, your masajid will be grand structures, but devoid of guidance. And when you go into that building and you see, what a wonderful building, beautiful, your tears will fall from your eyes. When you remember what the Prophet said, yes, big building. But no guidance. And then the hadith ends. Ulama'uhum. The religious scholars of Islam at that time. Your muftis. Your ustad. Your maulana. Your sheikh. Ulama'uhum sharrun nasi mimman tahta adim is sama. They would be the worst people beneath the sky. That's what he said. The religious scholars of Islam will be the worst people beneath the sky. They will be the centers of corruption, corrupting the people, in consequence of which the innocent people go home, they eat biryani and go to sleep, not knowing that you've lost Islam, you've surrendered Islam. In the next lecture, which I hope will be, we'll fix a date and you'll let me know sometime in September, inshallah. We now ask ourselves, well, what can we do? What should we do? We have a very serious situation now that this is the transition from this monetary system.